Rev it up and welcome to Cars Yeah, show number 2180. Be prepared to be inspired. This is Cars Yeah, where you'll enjoy interviews with inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Mark Green is here to provide you with a fuel injection of automotive inspiration. So get in, sit down, buckle up, and get ready for a wild ride here on Cars Yeah. Hello, inspiring automotive enthusiasts, and welcome to Cars Yeah. Today I'm in Phoenixville. Ah, think about where Phoenixville is. Pennsylvania, of course, with a very special guest by the name of Harry Hurst. Harry, welcome to Cars Yeah. Do you have any gear, and are you ready to release the clutch? <laughs> totally, totally ready. Thank you, Mark. You're welcome. We're going to have some fun today. Now, before I give you a proper introduction, boy, what a life you've had, could you share one little thing that maybe people don't know about Harry Hurst? Well, I've, I've kind of thought back on it, and uh, the one thing I, you know, people know me for the automotive side, uh, but a lot of people don't know I actually had my career in advertising and public relations, and at one time, I headed up the uh, public relations for the power tool division of Black & Decker, and in the mid-80s, I got them involved in the uh, restoration of the Statue of Liberty. They became the official power tool supplier to the Statue of Liberty, and uh, as part of that, I went up every month <clears throat> from Philadelphia up to New York City and went out on one of the work boats to the uh, to Liberty Island and uh, asked them what they needed and all of that. And, and what came out of that is we actually designed special tools for them to use so that they could remove the thousands and thousands of rivets uh, that held the copper skin onto the armature. They had to remove all of that. And uh, so we made these special tools that enabled that rivet to be drilled out without doing any damage or marring the copper uh, surface on the outside. That must have been what a fun experience. Oh, it was. A, and, and being a photographer, you know, of course, you know, I, I took my camera every yeah. time. So I have these incredible shots of the inside of the Statue of Liberty and stuff. You know, I, I got to go places where, well, just a, a one thing, I, I uh, actually got to stand on the scaffolding on the outside of the statue right next to her nose and, <laughs> and, and and the scaffolding was about two feet away from the from the statue it did not touch the copper at all and uh, you could lean over and and actually <laughs> tickle her put, nose put your hand on her nose but the trouble then is you'd look down it was a 200 foot drop straight down yeah wow you should make a or i know you've we'll talk a little bit about some of the books you've written but that would be a great picture book yeah 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 wow yeah. what a fun experience well you know, that's why I like to ask that question. And I'll let you listeners know before I introduce Harry. Harry and I met back in, I think it was 2017 at the SEMA show. He had a customer there. So we kind of have known each other a while, but we finally reconnected, right? Right. Yeah, right. this is pretty cool. Well, let me give you a proper introduction. Harry Hurst is the director of programs for the Simeon Museum in Philadelphia, an institution he helped Dr. Fred Simeon launch in 2008. You you uh, listeners will remember I had Fred as a guest on the show before we sadly lost him. Uh, if you missed that talk, go back and listen to uh, Dr. Fred Simeon because he's quite spectacular. As part of his role, Harry put his 35 years of marketing experience to use in producing brochures and conceiving the unique demo days at the museum. We're going to learn about that too. His interest in cars goes back to his first car, a 1953 MGTD. You listeners, again, a lot of relationships here. My dad had a TC when I was a little boy. Loved the old MGs. This led to his first career as an English sports car mechanic and shop owner. He's written service manuals for Jaguar and worked as technical representative for DeLorean. Yeah. His advertising clients include Exide, Adena, SKF, Mal, Odyssey, and Black & Decker, as he talked about. While still in college, he was a track photographer for Sebring 12 Hours Racing in Florida. He also photographed races at Daytona and Road Atlanta during what many enthusiasts feel were the glory days of racing. And guess what? He is published author and founder of the Facebook group Glory Days of Racing that is approaching 50,000 members. Very cool. We'll be learning more about Harry and a lot more about his past, but first a word from our sponsors, so give them a little love, and we'll be right back. Buckle up. Autumn has arrived. The weather is changing, 
and that means your vehicle needs extra protection against everything that Mother Nature can drop. Covercraft offers you a multitude of layers and protection for your special rides. Are you putting your summer toys, watercraft, RV, motorcycles, trailers, even your patio furniture away? Well, Covercraft has a custom fit cover just for you. Covercraft offers you 10 different car cover options. That's right, 10 for your vehicle's protection, whether you store it inside or out. All carefully crafted into the form and fit with the quality and attention to detail that's been their standard since 1965. And don't forget, their custom fit seat covers, pet pads, Yeah, Fido's going to get wet and muddy. Dash mats, sunscreens, and custom fit floor mats and trunk mats are available at Covercraft.com. Whatever the surface you want to protect, Covercraft has a solution just for you. And if you use the code YEAH21 at Covercraft.com, you'll get 10% off your Covercraft order plus free shipping. That's right, 10% off and free shipping. Simply use the code YEAH21 at checkout. Come on, Mother Nature, bring it on. Covercraft, protecting the things that move you. Fall is here, and you know what that means. Time to put a good coat of protection on your vehicle. I'm teamed up with AutoGeek, and they've been the leading source of auto detailing products, accessories, and expert knowledge for more than 20 years. What started back in 1997 as a small mail order catalog company grew into a multi-website based e-commerce store, and that's what they are today. With a large online presence on its own website featuring close to 100 different brands, AutoGeek has grown to be the largest car care retailer in the country. AutoGeek's wholesale program serves accounts in over 30 countries, and its retail sector ships worldwide. If you want to protect your vehicle this fall, and you should, go to AutoGeek.net for the best product selection on the internet today and technical support. AutoGeek.net is where I go for my detailing needs. That's AutoGeek.net. I was talking with a buddy of mine the other day, and he asked me about American Collectors Insurance. He said, while I listen to you on Cars Yeah, you're always talking about agreed value collector car insurance. Well, I insure all my cars on my regular auto insurance policy, and I've done it for years. Why use a different company for my collector cars? I get a multi-car discount. Isn't that good enough? I suggested he call his carrier and ask how much he would get if his collector car was totaled are stolen. He called back and said, boy, that was a scary conversation. Their value of my car wasn't even close to what it's really worth. Thank you for the education, Mark. So don't just hope for a fair claim settlement. Be certain and know exactly what you receive with an agreed value policy. American Collectors Insurance has been protecting enthusiasts since 1976. Give them a call today for your personal agreed value quote at 866-ACI-YEAH. That's 866 866- 224-9324. Tell them you're a friend of Mark Green's at Cars Yeah. American Collectors Insurance, classic car insurance designed by collectors for collectors, automotive enthusiasts just like you and me. That's American Collectors Insurance. So Harry, what a life you've had. My goodness. I mean, you have done things in so many different arenas. So let's kind of start back at the beginning in your advertising and PR days. And then we're going to kind of work through all these cool things that you've done, talk about the Simeon Museum, authoring books, and of course, this Facebook page you've got, Glory Days of Racing, which is oh so cool. So take it away. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, the Simeon Museum, you know, certainly is is the high point there as far as I'm concerned. Um, you know, as most of your listeners know, it's, it has several times been selected as the greatest collection of, of automobiles, the greatest automotive collection in the world. And this is by the Classic Car Trust uh, in the Netherlands. I was there in 2007, and while it was still just a bare building, and uh, you know, watched as Fred directed the, as we called it affectionately, the Craigslist Construction Company, uh, <laughs> to to do all the renovations. You know, he he was very good at finding good quality people. You know, at a at a, a low fair cost. Price, yeah, yeah. You know, everything that you know when you go into the museum, everything there was Fred's vision. Uh, you know, he he did you know talk to consultants. He actually took courses in museum 
in management at Temple University. But, you know, everything you see there is how he wanted it to be. And uh, and it's really quite remarkable, uh, you know, that uh, that he did that. You know, you mentioned also the uh, uh, the Facebook group, and that's kind of an interesting story. I, you know, two years ago, uh, I had about 500 members on this group. And every now and then I'd go up and post a photo, you know, from, from what I had. But it was when COVID hit, we were down at our house in Florida, and I had all of my photos with me, and I hadn't scanned probably 99% of the photos I had taken over the years. And so I thought, well, we're stuck in the house and I can't go out, so I might as well sit down and start doing it. So I started scanning all these photos and I started posting them up on the Glory Days Facebook, Jen writing a little story about each one. And I'd post maybe five or six a day because that was all I had to do. <laughs> yeah. And pretty soon I noticed, you know, we go for 500 to 1,000 and then 2,500 and then 5,000. Well, and by Halloween this year, I, I fully expect we're going to hit 50,000. Wow. That's incredible. Congratulations. That's not easy to do. Well, I tell you, every morning, uh, you know, I sit down while I'm watching TV and having my coffee and, and I go through, I review every new member app and uh, I get a hundred new member applications every day. And wow. I, I screen them all, make sure they're, you know, we're not getting any spam yeah. or bots or anything. But yeah, I mean, there's, it's amazing to me, you know, that there are so many of us out there, you know, we kind of lose sight of that. And and you, you know that. You know? Well, yeah, you know, it's something, uh, it's a case to give something attention and it'll grow. Yeah. And in the case of uh, Facebook and, and what it's become and a way for people to connect, especially in the automotive sector, it's really tremendous what you've yeah. done there. And I love the fact that you're keeping this whole heritage and story alive because you post things that I learn all the time. Like, what? I, huh? Really? Well, the cool. one thing, you know, I really try and I did this with my books as well, where they really rely a lot on the recollections and remembrances of people who were there. So I try to do the same thing on the Glory Days Facebook page is recognize a lot of people that you may never have known about or you heard their name, but you don't know anything about them. A good example is is a guy named Bobby Brown, who I happen to see his name, you know, in a lot of races, you know, and uh, uh, Can-Am and, and uh, Formula 5000 and things like that. And I found out more about him. I've gotten to be very good friends with him and he's fabulous. But he, you know, he uh, bought Dan Gurney's old McLegal, uh, McLaren uh, Can-Am car and actually had more success with that car than Dan did. Uh, he almost won the 1970 Road Atlanta Can-Am, which uh, I wrote a book about just recently. I did a whole book on that one race. It's tremendous. You don't want to go back a little bit to your work at the Simeon Museum. Sure. You know, as I mentioned, we, we lost Fred recently and it's so sad. And uh, But when something like this happens, especially such an integral part of the museum, what is the future of the museum without Fred? Will it continue on? Yeah, and that, uh, you know, I'm glad you asked that. Uh, you know, Fred actually was not in really good health for the last year of his life. And before that, he was there every single day. He'd, he'd get there, you know, at nine in the morning and probably leave around nine o'clock at night. I wow. mean, he, he was there all the time. And uh, and then he, he started getting uh, ill and w was not able to come in at all. And so that allowed uh, Amanda, Amanda Jimenez and uh, Kevin Kelly. Uh, Amanda's now, has been with Fred, was with Fred for many years, even with his medical practice. And then Kevin had been the curator, uh, you know, taking care of the cars. Kevin is now the new executive director. But it gave them a year to kind of run the day-to-day -day operation of the museum without Fred actually being there, uh, but still available if they had a question or wanted to ask his advice. So, uh, and then uh, Christina Simeone, uh, uh, Fred's daughter, uh, has, you know, is the chairman of the board of the, of the foundation foundation that runs the museum. So it's in very good shape. And Fred Fred had planned for the transition. Fred had planned for the endowment. And he you know, he knew it was coming. He was very much a student of what had happened at other museums. He knew the pitfalls. So it is in good shape. And I got to say, Kevin is doing a fabulous job carrying on, uh, you know, the educational function of the museum. Yeah, we got to get Kevin on the show. Love to talk Absolutely. to him. Yeah, and, Absolutely. Yeah, and share that. Now, another big part of your your 
history in your profession is photography. And I saw, uh, while I was at the Quail, two years, I believe, and you can correct me here, I think it was 2013 and 2017, do I have those right? 18. 18, yeah, Yeah. where you had an exhibit of your beautiful photographs there. Uh, But photography has been a big key in your career, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I got to say, I think I got it from my mom. She was, an, uh, you know, just an avid snapshot photographer. She documented our family's life with her little Instamatic. And uh, when I I was an avid race car fan, we had relatives that came down from Chicago every year. You know, everybody in Florida has has relatives that uh, come and visit in the wintertime from the north. And they came down and they were huge racing fans. And they would come and stay with us. And I grew up in Tampa, which is only about two hours from Sebring. And so they would come, stay with us, and then go over to Sebring. And they would, at the dinner table, they would say, oh, Sterling Moss this and Sterling Moss that. And wow. you know, my, my parents and grandmother hated it, but I just became fascinated. And so in uh, 1965, I went to my first Sebring and I would take my mom's Instamatic. And of course, I'm, you know, on the other side of the fence, on you know, on the spectator side. But, you know, I was able to get some relatively interesting shots, even with an Instamatic. And, uh, and then when I uh, was in uh, a senior uh, in high school, my dad got me a, a 35 millimeter. And I went to my first race uh, where I was a flagman in 69 at Daytona for the 24 and shot with 35 millimeter. And after that, I, you know, I was hooked. Uh, I was able uh, to get the job as track photographer. Uh, John Smiley saw someone who was the press officer, saw my photos through a friend and asked me if I wanted to shoot for him. And I said, sure, you know, of course. And uh, it just kind of went that way. And I I stayed as track photographer there until uh, uh, 1971. uh, And then, uh, you know, I I kind of started pulling away from it, uh, you know, because of school and, and other things. But I've, I've kind of kept into it. Uh, you know, as my clients have been involved in motorsports, I've, I've gone to races and taken photographs uh, and, and done that kind of thing. No, it's very cool. And you've also published some books uh, about mm-hmm. this this racing. And typically I ask people for favorite books. And in our pre-show chat listeners, uh, Harry mentioned this, your books, they're out of print now. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Uh, you can still get the 65 Sebring book with Dave Friedman's photos. I have a few copies of that left yeah, okay. uh, on, on Amazon. But yeah, the, the other ones are pretty much out of print right well, now. Well, let's, ch- let's touch on those a little bit here because I know you got some uh, book references for our listeners later in the show when I ask mm-hmm. about that. But so your first book was uh, 12 Hours of Sebring, 1970? 70. Yeah. yeah. And you may remember that, uh, you know, it's funny. At the time, I don't think anybody really paid a whole lot of attention to it. I had all of my photographs were in, in boxes. I had never looked at them in, in 30 years. Oh my gosh. Oh yeah. I mean, well, it's like a lot of people, you know, you put them away and you know, it's out of, and, and I had a life and I was raising a family and all of that, you know? And, uh, uh and then, um, uh, uh, I, I noticed some of my photos started appearing on the internet and I traced it down. You know, I had sent prints of all of my photos to the press officer at Sebring. And when Alec Allman died, who was, you know, the promoter, the organizer of Sebring, when he died, all of those archives got sold and, and people had been scanning my, and I never put a, a, a credit stamp on the back. I didn't know enough to do that. Yeah. You know, I just sent them eight by 10 glossy print. <laughs> sure. And uh, and I noticed my my photos were appearing on the on the Internet and and in books, but unattributed and to me. And so I said, well, heck, I mean, if they're doing it, I can, too. So I put together I I would call it a storyboard uh, of that race, that one particular race is starting, you know, chronologically at the beginning and then going through and kind of telling the story a little bit with, you know, some captions. And I sent it to people and got their input and and, uh, actually. Actually, it was um, uh, uh, Michael Kaiser uh, that said, oh, you know, yeah. you, should, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, you should interview a 
other people besides yourself, you know, that were there and get their input. And I thought, well, okay, that's not a bad idea. So I, I printed up Xerox copies of the book and sent it to Dan Gurney and people like that, you know, and said, hey, can I talk to you? And yeah, everybody said, sure. And so I started interviewing all these people and, and putting putting facing captions, uh, uh, quotes on uh, opposite photos that they related to, uh, you know, from uh, uh, of what the people remembered about the race. And uh, I even remember at the very end, I sent it to Mario Andretti. Mario won the race. And I didn't expect to get a call at all from him, uh, you know, because he's Mario. But, uh, you know, two days later, I get a call. Said, this is Mario. There's so goddamn much wrong with this book. I don't know where to begin. Oh, my gosh. I swear. Wow. And he goes and he goes goes through and he's saying now my lap time that year you know that it wasn't you know three minutes 33 seconds it was you know you know he he knew he (laughs) knew all of this to the tenth of a second he had the most amazing memory and so we went through and he corrected everything in it and uh you know in that of course is the race that steve mcqueen was driving with a broken foot and Mm -hmm. almost won the race but mario jumps in the second place ferrari at the end and chases peter revson down and and wins by 23 seconds so it now has become an an iconic endurance race but at the time that the book came out it really wasn't and uh, you know it i had an, a bunch of advanced copies that I had air freighted uh, when uh, you know over when it was printed, mm-hmm. and I sent it to all the magazines and stuff. And uh, I get this call from Tom Bryant, who was editor uh, at the time of Road and Track, and he said, uh, "Harry, I just want you to be on the lookout uh, for the um, uh, December issue." And so, uh, you know, right before Thanksgiving, all of a sudden, my fax machine uh, spits out this page, and it was his whole monthly column wow. for the December issue was on my book and calling it one of the greatest racing event books he had ever read wow. and and this is this is four weeks before Christmas. Oh God, yeah. <laughs> I had self-funded the book. You know, I tried to sell the book to other publishers, and they wouldn't. Uh, they had no interest in it. They called it a ballroom book, and I said, "What's a ball?" And they said, "Well, all the people that would be interested in this book would fit into a ballroom." Oh. So my wife said, well, you know, then you've just got to print it yourself. And so I did. I, I've wow. spent $20,000 of my own money, our own money, printing the book. And uh, uh, because of that road and track uh, article, uh, the book was paid for by Christmas. So, Well, <laughs> advertising, you come from that world. It works. Yeah. 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 It's tremendous. Well, unfortunately, that book's out of print. It was published back in 2004. But I bet you if you go out there, listeners, you might be able to find a copy yeah. in a used bookstore or somewhere on eBay. That's a great place I get some books that are out of print. Uh, when we come back, we're going to take a short break for our sponsors here. We're going to talk a little bit about inspirations and challenges. So uh, sit tight. And by the way, we'll talk also about two other books when we get to the book section uh, that Terry has written. So sit tight. We'll be right back. You've heard me talk about Linkage Magazine here on Cars yeah, for several years, ever since they first came out. Linkage Magazine is geared for the automotive life. It's all about experiences, opinions, and values. It's a beautifully designed magazine. It's one you'll look forward to getting. Well, guess what? In 2023, Linkage Magazine is growing to six issues a year instead of four. And if you use a special renew code, if you're already a subscriber or use this, if you're not already a subscriber, you'll still get the deal. You can get several free issues for the price of four. Plus they'll throw in a free linkage hat. So go to linkagemag.com, use promo code renew six for one year or renew 12 for two years and take advantage of their new six issues for the price of four. But again, you got to do it before December 31st, 2022. This also makes a great holiday gift. Linkage Magazine. Go to LinkageMag.com and subscribe today. Cars Yeah! has teamed up with TechForce Foundation, one of our charities of choice, to help young people who love cars, problem solving, and working with their hands pursue careers as professional technicians. From auto, collision, and restoration techs to motorcycle boats, race cars, and aviation, TechForce covers the gamut of technician opportunities. Technical education and the skills trades matter, and we need qualified skilled technicians to keep our vehicles rolling. Learn how you can help to power the technical workforce at techforce.org today. So, Harry, I always ask my guests about inspirations, inspirational people, driving influencers, driving inspirations. You've been around so many incredible people that have probably been great inspirations to you. But is there one that stands out you could share with us today? 
Well, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's Fred Simeon, uh, and and I'll tell you why. You know, I mean, I've met a, a, a lot of pretty interesting people, for sure, you know, mostly in the automotive uh, sector, uh, you know, that have accomplished really great things. But, you know, Fred, you know, we all we all knew Fred, you know, because he was a car guy. And uh, but, you know, very few of us knew Dr. Simeon. And that was a whole nother world uh, that Fred was in. And uh, Fred was one of the world's foremost neurosurgeons. He was so good that the the State Department arranged for him to go to Saudi Arabia to operate on on a member of the Saudi royal family. And they and they built him uh, his own operating theater to his own specifications. Oh my god. Yeah. I mean he was at the time well the, the textbook The Spine that is used in medical schools all over the world is authored by you know one of the co authors is Fred Simeon. You know, so there there was this whole other world of what he did that, you know, we're, we really aren't uh, aware of. And I, I'll tell you when it really hit me, what a what a great, great man he was. I walked into uh, the museum one, one morning, and, you know, going uh, in, up to my office and walked through the lobby. And he's sitting there on the, on the couch in the lobby, and there's uh, an older gentleman with him. And uh, Fred is holding his hand, and you can see tears, you know, coming down this guy's face, you know, his cheeks, and, he, and he's sobbing. And so I just, you know, I walk very quietly and, you know, go through and go up to my office. And, you know, about 15, 20 minutes later, Fred comes in, you know, into my office and he sits down and he said, I, I guess you're wondering what that was all about. And I said, yeah, well, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't going to ask. And he said, well, about 15 years ago, his daughter, who was about 11 at the time, had a brain tumor and it was on the back of her spinal cord. And and this thing had gotten totally uh, inter, inter interconnected into the into the spinal cord, and I had to go and literally strand by strand remove this tumor, you know, from her spinal cord. The operation took you know seven, eight, nine hours. Uh, you know, it was incredibly, incredibly complicated. And he came in today to tell me that yesterday she had a baby girl. Oh, my gosh. Wow. What a wonderful story. Yeah. You know, he told me that and I just thought, God, you know, <laughs> I mean, anything, you know, anything we do, you know, pales by comparison to what people like Fred do, you know, the people in the medical community that can really, you know, have a dramatic effect on, on other people's wow, lives. that's tremendous. I have a good friend, Bill, who I used to race vintage cars with. He was a vintage racer. He's a neurosurgeon, pediatric neurosurgeon. Yeah. And uh, yeah, he would, you know, he'd come over uh, when I was working in a previous career. Thursday nights, we'd have boys night out and I'd invite a bunch of guys over to come over and test products I was developing and have fun. We'd go have dinner and he was kind of the one that was always there except when he was in a surgery and mm -hmm. um i talked to him quite often about the people that he treated and you know people that uh whose lives he changed and so forth and i asked him one time i said bill you know you you be around all this life and death in these situations i said what have you learned from this and he said life's very fragile Take care of yourself and cherish every moment. And it's a cliche, but it's true. He said, I, I had people that had been on my table that woke up that morning, thought it was going to be just another normal day, and they tripped on a curb and hit their head. And that's the end. So, uh, yeah, tree, it, it's cliche, but every day is special, unique, and um, tremendous to have people like Fred, my friend Bill, and so many others who uh, care for people in our lives. Wonderful story. I appreciate you sharing that. You know, I like to ask about challenges, and you've been around long enough to have faced a few challenges in your life. Is there one that stands out that taught you a really valuable lesson? Well, I mean, it, it's certainly the launch of that first book that I did, I think was, you know, I had, I had started several businesses. I had a shop in Florida. I started an advertising agency in the middle of a recession. But, you know, I think the, uh, the book was the most sobering when I, I had this thing completely finished and I was very proud of it. And, and uh, I was told that, uh, <clears throat> you know, nobody really had any interest at all uh, in, uh, uh, in printing it. And, uh, you know, again, it was my wife, uh, you know, who, who said, you know, you got to do it. And, uh, uh, you know, it, uh, uh, and, and as, it, and it turned out, you know, good, uh, you know, and I mean, I was lucky, uh, to some degree, but, uh, you know, I did the footwork also, you know, to create that luck. And, uh, uh, you know, you just never, you, you never know how things are going to turn out with, with things like that. No, no. And uh, boy, I've interviewed so many authors on this show and who share the same kinds of stories. 
Um, you think about the Harry Potter series of books and, yeah. and that author, she took that to many places. She was just dirt poor broke and several publishers said, nah, not interested. <laughs> They're looking back going, yeah. oh, what yeah. a mistake that was. Yeah. You know, you just never know. I mean, how things will take off. So let's talk a little bit about a special vehicle. I know there's one car and mentioned it in your <laughs> intro. MGs have a special place in my life. My had a four, my dad had a 49 TC when I was five, six, seven years old. That w- is what stuck it to me with cars because sitting in that thing as a little boy was like just the magical. It was like Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, you know? It yeah, was a flying yeah. magical machine. So tell us about your 53 MG TD. Well, I, I got that when I was uh, 16 years old uh, in Florida. You you could you could drive uh, uh, at 16, and uh, my grandmother actually bought it for me. I I know I paid way too much for it, but uh, <laughs> I'll tell you a funny story how how I came to pick uh, uh, an MGTD. I I have like many of your listeners, uh, I would read road and track and car and driver and all of those. In fact, I, I have road and track going back to 1952 oh my gosh. In, in my library and I'm reading through road and track. And here's this article on this British sports car. I'd never heard of it before called a Squire. Mm. And I looked at it and I went, Oh my God, this most beautiful car I've ever seen. You know, I mean, it was made, you know, 1930s, you know, classic British car. And uh, I said, I want to have one of those, you know, when I, you know, when I grow up and uh, I can have a car. Well, they only made six of them before he died. Oh my so gosh. You're not, you're not going to own a Squire, right? Uh, but an MGTD was, you know, the next best thing. It looked very, very similar to it. And as a funny story, years later, when I went through and saw Fred's collection for the first time, when it was in a nondescript two-story garage off of uh, South Street in Philadelphia, I walk up and here is this powder blue car and it's a Squire. And I said, oh my God, a Squire. I never thought I'd ever even see one. And it turns out it was not just a Squire. It was the same Squire that was in that magazine. Oh, article. my gosh. <laughs> yeah. You're like reunited. It, it, it was really funny. Yeah. Wow. And uh, so and so I bought this uh, 53 TD in 1967. And, uh, you know, after, you know, a couple of things went wrong and I had to deal with the local dealership, you know, I said, well, heck, I can figure this out. And now my dad wasn't mechanically uh, adept at all, but I could read books and I, I had an interest. So I got a set of tools, didn't even know enough to get British standard at the time. You know, I thought it was metric and uh, I learned that quickly and a shop manual and I started fixing it myself. In fact, I, I ended up actually when I was a senior in high school. Uh, I rebuilt the engine myself, uh, you know, which was pretty, pretty big for, you know, a 17 year old kid. And uh, and that led to, you know, getting jobs at dealerships, uh, working on cars and then eventually having my own shop in Tallahassee for a number of years. And uh, and then uh, uh, finding the company in Philadelphia that did the service training for Jaguar and uh, coming up to Philly to uh, to do that. So it, it kind of that MGTD really kind of steered my entire life because. Even my advertising and public relations has been very heavily slanted towards the automotive sector. And my intimate knowledge of mechanics uh, and having worked as a mechanic uh, has really helped me in in the advertising world. Yeah. You know, the Squire, I remember seeing one of those. I can't remember the year on the lawn at Pebble. It was a dark, was it black or dark blue if I remember yeah. right. But if you look at the lines of that, it's kind of like a big stretched out MG. Yeah. Yeah, of course, they all kind of look similar, you know, at that time period. But it's, in my opinion, you know, by far the most beautiful of all of that generation. Well, and it had those, the the headlights, if I remember, were kind of a little bit odd. They were kind of like set out forward or something. They were kind of mounted on a bar or something like that. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. And, that, and, they're, and they're larger than... than very big, yeah. yeah. And the radiator yeah. was laid back. It was, it's a Laid great, back, yeah. yeah that's the thing. It didn't have the stand-up radiator as much as it kind of laid back a little bit. I mean, it's just... It's a beautiful Beautiful car. It Beautiful is. Car. Yeah. Stunning. Stunning. So I'm going to be your car psychologist. Today I get to be the doctor. And uh, <laughs> that's just crazy Dr. Mark and uh, the car doctor. And I'm going to crawl into your head and ask you a unique question. If you were manifest, reincarnated, pun intended, mm. as a vehicle, not what you want to be, though. It's how you perceive the man in the mirror. What would Harry Hurst be? But more importantly, why? Well, if 
I was to see myself, I, of course, am uh, an <laughs> E-type Jaguar. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yeah, because I'm sleek, stylish, and a high performer. <laughs> okay, right? there you go. Now, I, I told that to my wife uh, yesterday, and she looked at me and she said, uh, Harry, you're a Capricorn. <laughs> you, you know, you're plodding and steady, and you're able to move heavy things. You're yeah. you're really more like a Land Rover. <laughs> Well, you know, sometimes our our wives uh, are all knowing. I, I've been married thirty eight years now, and uh, yeah, sometimes they set us straight. I think that's a pretty funny answer to that question. But I'm a Capricorn too, so yeah, I'm, uh-huh. I'm not quite a Jaguar E type either. So, did we decide on the Land Rover? Yeah, I'm afraid. I'm afraid I'm a Land Rover. Yeah, just kind of get the job done. That's okay, but, but reliable. You know, even even those British. You know, I'm, I'm reliable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we've talked about. Uh, one of the books you wrote, you also wrote a book about uh, the 1970 Road Atlanta Can-Am race, yeah. which is pretty cool. And uh, was there a third one that you've done? The 65 Sebring book uh, that I yeah. wrote with Dave Friedman's Yeah, photos. that's yeah. right. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, you had a commentary in there with Jim Hall, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I got to interview Jim Hall repeatedly. Uh, uh, you talk about, you know, Mario being a, a stickler for detail. Oh, my God. Jim Hall being an engineer, you can only imagine, you know. And uh, But, you know, he said, uh, you know, this is an important race for me. You know, I want to make sure this is right. So we spent a lot of time. He reviewed every word of it. And uh, uh, and it, uh, I think it turned out good. It was actually – this came out in 2006 – and to my knowledge, this was the first time he explained in detail what the, quote, automatic transmission was. And, uh, you know, everybody said, well, you know, and in fact, Ford tried to make a, a, a real automatic. And he said, no, it, it wasn't an automatic. What it, what it was is we, it didn't have a clutch. It had a torque converter. But it still, it was either a two-speed or a three-speed manual box that, you know, you shifted it manually. But you, you just matched the RPM, you know, the same way you do when you, you double clutch, you know, a, an MG. Sounds kind of like the Sportomatic that Porsche oh, had. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was kind of an odd one. Way to shit. I drove one once. I'm like, this is weird. I don't think I like this. Uh, but you had to kind of learn how to do it. And uh, uh, in 2021, you published uh, the 1970 Road Atlanta Can Am race with a forward with the great Vic Elford, uh, another yeah. wonderful past guest here, sadly, that we lost. Oh, man. What a great guy he was. He and, and, and Anita both, you know, Anita. Anita left us uh, not not long after that, and uh, you know, I mean, just a, a wonderful people, and uh, you know, I I kind of did that book, uh, you know, as a tribute to him. I got, you know, he wrote the foreword for the book, uh, and uh, you know, that of course was one of the few times that the uh, the two J the sucker car appeared, and um, and it was also again, it was kind of an interesting race in that it was one of the few races of that era, that period that uh, McLaren did not win. Uh, the race was. And the, uh, the very first race at Road Atlanta, very first professional race at Road Atlanta, and uh, it was won by Tony Dean and a little three-liter Porsche 908. <laughs> there you go. You know, it's a great story, of, of again, of perseverance, you know? I mean, he just steady and plodding, and he was there at the right time at the, you know, at the end of the race, you know? Quick, Vic. You know, um, I met Vic Elford at Laguna Seca when he was uh, there, and they were featuring many of the cars by Jim Hall and he jumped we were down my son I was with my son I forget Blake must have been nine or ten maybe eleven and we were down on the pit wall it was the Thursday before the race has started and the sucker car pulls up and Blake looks at me and goes what is that mm-hmm. and we're talking about it and I said well there's there's a guy who raced that car Vic Elford and I, we introduced ourselves and Vic told Blake about the car and then he climbed into it and took it out for some laps yeah. and uh, I said you're seeing history here kiddo uh, yeah. of a guy that raced credible amount of Porsches because we were a Porsche family. Anyway, it was a wonderful moment in time to get to share with my son. So and how about one great book you'd like to share that you didn't write? Well, if if I could, I'd like to do two. That's fine. Uh, one, one, you know, I recently Ford v. Ferrari, you know, really kind of generated a whole lot of interest in, in non racing people you know about that and it and it's a great story and you know in the movie really you know the the premise of the movie was certainly correct but a lot of the facts you know for for many of us you know some of the facts that uh, they they did you know got it wrong but i highly recommend go like hell for uh, by aj Baum. if you want a really entertaining book that gets 
I'd say it gets the story pretty, pretty straight. And uh, he did a wonderful job with that and, uh, and, and really explains it. The other book, we had uh, Craig Breedlove in as our 2011 Spirit of Competition Award recipient at the Simeon. And as part of doing that, I found a book I did not know of called Speed Duel. Uh, by a guy named Samuel Hawley, a Canadian. And he wrote this book. It's pretty much concentrating on Craig Breedlove and Art Arfons and the battle they had in that time time on uh, setting the land speed record, but it goes back in time to give a little history of land speed record in the 50s and how it got to the point in 1964 uh, when Craig Breedlove uh, broke the 400 mile an hour speed barrier. And, and it gets into a lot of the people, you know, Campbell and, and, and those people. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, I had no idea. It was a bit sanitized for us uh, when we read about it in Road and Track and Car and Driver and Sports Car Graphic uh, in the 60s. And I, I don't remember hearing about the number of people who lost their lives getting to that point. And Molly tells that story in Speed Duel. I would highly recommend the book and you can get it uh, on Amazon. Yeah, uh, it's, it's great. I've had Several very well-known guests who set land speed records uh, on this show and authors of great books about those we've lost. And, of course, uh, um, guests that I've had on this show that we've lost as well, sadly, uh, trying to set land speed records. Yeah. Gnar gnarly stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, just hard. I mean, you start getting over 150 miles an hour and then 200, and then beyond that, you're in a whole nother place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That you don't think about. And one other book I'd like to mention, Mark, is one that uh, has just come out called Boost. And it's the story of one of racing's more colorful figures, Roger Bailey. And I met Roger almost by accident. I had been shooting uh, the Can-Am race at Road Atlanta and took pictures of the, this BRM mechanic. And when I did my book uh, on that race, I had these photos and uh, uh, I, I got, uh, you know, some, someone to identify uh, who this guy was. And it turned out, you know, it was it was Roger Bailey. And he and I have have developed a real friendship. And his story is amazing. He was the first non-Italian to be a factory Ferrari mechanic when he was Chris Amon's personal mechanic. And then uh, he went on to work for virtually every leading team uh, in racing at the time. Meekum, Penske, Chaparral. Shelby. The, I mean, the list is literally endless. And he ended up uh, at McLaren where he built the turbo engines. That's where the name Boost came from, his nickname. And then he went on to uh, launch the Indy Light Series uh, for, uh, for IRL and ran that for a number of years. And he's just an amazing guy. It's a great book. Gordon Kirby uh, was the writer of the book from, you know, working with Roger. And uh, we're actually going to have him and Gordon at the Simeon Museum on October 22nd. They're going to do a book signing and a, and a talk. I'll be interviewing both of them for it. So anybody in the Philadelphia area, uh, stop by the Simeon on the 22nd. Well, I'm going to enable you to go on a safe drive today. Uh, the <laughs> ultimate drive, I'm going to park anything you'd like in your driveway. You can take it anywhere with you. Uh, uh -huh. And you can take anybody with you, even somebody from the past. Uh, okay. who's not with us anymore, which kind of opens up the window of opportunity. So what does the ultimate drive look like for Harry Hurst? Well, th this one was very easy. I didn't even have to think about it. Okay. This. I'm taking Brock Yates's place okay. on, the, on the Cannonball Baker Sea to <laughs> Shining Sea Memorial Trophy Dash okay. with Dan Gurney in the Daytona Ferrari. Uh, yeah. I mean, that has to be, I, 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 even now I think about what did they talk about oh. for, you know, for 36 hours. How to avoid the police, I think. Yeah. <laughs> but can you imagine, you know, mm. being the passenger with Dan Gurney in a Ferrari, you know, going cross country. No, I can't. And, uh, and I'll tell you what, what I really yeah, I've I've read a lot. Dan Gurney was my hero, as I'm sure you know. Many many of your your audience, you know, had Dan Gurney as their hero growing up. But I mean, I was a, a true. I, I'm I'm charter member Eagle Club number four twenty four. <laughs> wow. And uh, uh, you know, I I made models and sent them to Dan. You know, uh, you know when I was when I was a teenager. But the thing that fascinates me, and it and it harkens back to what time what those 
days were like. You know, Dan was in the Korean War, comes back. You know, he's he's not young, young. I mean, he you know he's in his late twenties and teaches himself he and Skip Hudson how to how to drive. You know, on the on the paved. Uh, well, the, the the graded elements of Riverside before they paved it, and and he had his first race in a TR2, uh, and didn't I, I don't know I think he came in tenth or something. I mean, it wasn't like he was an overnight sensation, but less than two dozen races later, he's racing a factory Formula One Ferrari. I know it's it's mind boggling. How <laughs> how did yeah. that happen? Yeah. You know, and again, you know he. People helped him, Luigi Canetti, of course. Uh, but, you know, I just find it amazing that, you know, that was just that time. You know, if you had that talent and you were at the right place at the right time, uh, you know, you, you could, uh, uh, you know, you could you could achieve things like that. Yeah. Amazing life, uh, Dan. Yeah. Had and uh, made it so special for so many of us enthusiasts. Well, you've taken us on a wonderful ride here today, Harry. And I want to uh, do a shout out. Thank you to a mutual friend who recommended Harry for the show, Alexander Sultanis. Alexander has been a guest on the show. Appreciate the reference here. Uh, you brought me an awesome guy here with Harry Hurst. A uh, wonderful talk today. Before I let you go, could you share maybe some parting words of wisdom or inspiration with us? Well, I tell you, you know, I, one of my clients, XI Batteries, was sponsoring Allenzer Jr. in the mid-80s, and I went up to Nazareth, uh, you know, for the race up there, you know, take photos and just, mm -hmm. you know, make sure the batteries were okay and all of that. And I, I drive into Nazareth Speedway, and here's this big sign over the entryway, and it says, effort equals results. <laughs> I know that guy, <laughs> the captain. <laughs> the captain. Penske owned Nazareth at the time, and you go inside, and I'll tell you, man, that place was immaculate. It was really nice. And, you know, and I think of it, you know, that really is, you know, what life is about. You put forth the effort and, and you're going to get the results, but you've got to you've got to do that. Now, there is a corollary to that. And the corollary is you can't have 100 mm -hmm. percent. You know, you've got to realize, you know, you're, you're not going to be like Johnny Rocco in Key Largo, you know, <laughs> where, where you want more. You know, that's what I want. I want more. You know, you've got to find that the realistic level of what you can achieve and what you can get. But don't forget that put forth the effort and it will come to you. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. How can people learn more about you? And of course, most importantly, I've signed up on the Facebook page, Glory Days of Racing. How can they find you? Well, yeah, the, the Facebook group, uh, go up now. I ask you, you do have to answer all the questions uh, that yeah, are there. I went you know, through those. Me. I studied. Good. I studied Good. all night. I cramped okay. and I think I did okay. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and then I also have a website, uh, www.glorydaysofracing.com. It has some of my photos, information on the books. Uh, there There is a chance I may uh, reprint uh, some of the books uh, at some point in the future. I now have a way of doing them on a digital press, which means that I can... I can print 50 at a time. Now, the cost per book, of course, is much higher than what you would do if you're printing 2,000 uh, offset. But, uh, you know, again, it makes it reasonable. And the quality is exceptionally good. Yeah. I've, I've been very happy. So, Amazing. You know, if I get enough interest, I might uh, might start reprinting some of them. Well, there you go, listeners. Uh, reach out to Harry and say, hey, I want one of your books. Print that thing. You know, Christmas is coming. Great That's book right. for guests. I love giving <laughs> great books to my automotive friends and so forth. And I love having a great automotive library. Harry, this has been so much fun. I want to thank you for sharing a wonderful life, your expertise, and just a few of your many experiences. We could probably talk for hours. Until you and I do talk again, my friend, I'll see you down the road. Thank you, Mark. You're welcome. This was awesome. Thank you so much for joining us on today's ride here at Cars Yeah. Drive on over to CarsYeah.com to find show notes and inspiring automotive fun. Download your free copy of Filler Up, a fun book filled with gorgeous photographs of fuel filler fun, including quotes from more inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Download your copy today, and we'll see you next time on Cars Yeah!